Hello and welcome to Rugby and District Astronomical Society Sky Notes for April the 21st to May the 19th 2013. We'll start off as usual with the front page of the Sky Notes handout and you'll see here that we have the dates running along the bottom, summer time running up the left hand side and universal time running up the right hand side. So you read the chart from the bottom towards the top. At the bottom we have the planets rising and setting markers the colour coding for the planets and if the moon is below or b above the horizon. So we'll start off by looking at Jupiter. It's shown by the green line here and the downward pointing smaller lines show that the planet is setting at the time shown just after midnight on the 21st of May and just before 10 o'clock on the 19th of April. Moving on to Saturn, shown by the dark blue lines, the good news is that although we start to lose Jupiter in the evening Saturn will be quite prominent and moving steadily higher throughout the uh, period shown. And the planet setting markers uh, without accompanying planet rising markers mean at sunset Saturn will already have, be, have risen although it will be initially be quite low down on the eastern horizon. Here we have the markers for the moon. If it's below the horizon you stand a better chance of picking out deep sky objects and if it's above the horizon no need to pack away the telescope just because you've got a full moon. Have a look at the moon itself, have a look at the planets or even some of the double stars and brighter Messier objects. So we'll have a look at Jupiter now. T photo taken by Sarah Meek on the 13th of March this year. It clearly shows th three of the four Galilean moons. It's taken through a four inch a Celestron telescope using the Next Image webcam system. Chris Longthorne's provided this one, taken on the 19th of February. The cloud bandings are clearer, but he does have a uh, lot bigger telescope that he uses in his back garden observatory. And finally, here's one of mine, taken with my 9.25 inch Celestron and Next Image. And it does show the spot of the shadow of the, the moon Ganymede, which is the one immediately to the right of the planet itself on the cloud bands of Jupiter. And here we have Saturn. Um, taken very early in the morning on the 7th of April as it rose above the houses uh, that surround my back garden and you can clearly see the cloud banding on the planet, the Cassini division and even the planet's shadow on the ring system itself. We'll move on now to have a look at the night sky and I'm sure you can pick out the asterism known as the plough. This is part of the constellation Ursa Major as shown here, the Great Bear and we're going to be using this to do a bit of navigating around the sky. Most people will be familiar with the using the pointers to find Polaris by drawing the line as shown here, or the arc to find Arcturus, the arc formed by the tail, follow the curve down to the bright star Arcturus. We're going to start off by looking along the top two stars in the plough body itself. You follow this line along over quite a long part of the sky, you come to the uh, star Capella in the constellation of Auriga. We're going to be looking at this area here and rotating it 90 degrees clockwise. So here you can see Capella off to the right hand side in the constellation of Auriga and on the left we have Gemini with the stars Castor and Pollux. You can use these markers to find the area in the box which is where you'll find the Messier object M35, one of the open clusters. It's also worth having a look for M36, 7 and 8 which lie in Auriga itself while you're in this part of the sky and Castor is a nice double star for you to have a look at as well. Always worth having a trawl around some of the ob other objects as well as the one you're looking for to uh, make the most of the time spent in any particular area of the sky. We'll zoom in slightly further now and on the 30th of April to the 1st of May Vesta, the fourth of the asteroids discovered, will be passing quite close to M35, the open cluster. It will be magnitude 8 approximately so it should be easy to detect in a pair of binoculars or a small telescope as well as some of the larger instruments. It's actually better to use binoculars or a small scope in this circumstance because the field of view is wider and you actually see the cluster itself and if you look on the two nights and make a sketch or take a photo you should be able to see that Vesta has actually moved between the two nights. 
If you're looking for M35, it does look something like this. And I always think that there's a curve of stars that looks a bit like the body of a saxophone, as I've shown here. If you find this object, uh, the saxophone, in M35, you'll know you're in the right one of the clusters that are in the area. And here is Vesta itself. This is taken from one of the probes that actually spent nearly a year in orbit around the asteroid. It's about 540 kilometers long. And one of the notable features is the Snowman, a series of three craters shown here. We'll now have a look at the ISS and Iridium flares for the forthcoming week. We'll start off with the International Space Station. There are only three passes over the next few days and you'll see that from the altitude they are all fairly low down with the maximum altitude on the 22nd of April of 20 degrees in the southwest. It's always worth having a look out though for the pass of the International Space Station. It's about the size of a football pitch and the uh, biggest object that man has ever put into orbit. Here we have the ISS passing overhead in a fairly long duration photograph of about 35 to 40 seconds. You can see slight uh, trailing of the background stars and the ISS was moving from right to left in this image. If you take a short exposure you'll just get a point of light amongst other points of light whereas if you leave the shutter of your camera open for longer you'll actually have a trail much like the one you have here. Here we have an image from Emil Crykamp. He took this one just by pointing his telescope, which is a 10 inch reflector, towards the ISS as it, as it passed overhead. And he's emailed me to say that most of the 6,000 frames end up blank, but the ones where he gets the ISS in the frame, he tidies it up a little bit using some processing software and then puts the final image together, much as it's shown here. The, de how the details of his website with other images and some animations of the ISS going overhead will be in the titles at the end of this presentation. Moving on to the Iridium flares we can expect for the week. The brighter flares are shown by being highlighted in yellow, brighter meaning everything over magnitude minus 6. Uh, the best one we've actually seen on an observing night was magnitude minus 8.5 as it passed straight through Cassiopeia in the twilight which was well worth seeing. And there's also a double flare shown here. Double or triple flares occur in the same part of the sky within a few minutes of each other. And there is a triple flare on the 28th, uh, starting around about quarter past 11 to half past 11, where three individual Iridium satellites pass overhead, as seen from Rugby, uh, within the same part of the sky within a few minutes of each other. Well worth trying to get an image of this if you get the chance. You'll see that the International Space Station passes can take five minutes, sometimes longer, whereas the Iridium flares themselves are timed down to the exact second of when the flare reaches maximum brightness. Here we have an Iridium flare on the 27th of January taken by Sarah Meek. Nice little image this one because it, as well as the cigar shaped flare, we also have the Hyades, the face of Taurus the Bull with the orange star Aldebaran and Jupiter in the frame as well. If you capture a double flare it will look something like this. This is just over a minute and a half of, of exposure time which is why there is some um, the trailing of the stars and the two Iridium flares were only 41 seconds apart. The first one is the brighter one of the two, magnitude minus 7.3 and it's clearly far brighter than the magnitude minus 0 0.7 of the second of the two flares of the evening. Unfortunately, some of the thin high cloud is reflecting the street lights, which doesn't make it for the uh, the best picture in the world, but it still does show a nice iridium flare. We'll move on now to the comet C2011 L4 Panstars, which has been pretty much the highlight of March to April. Dave Riley was the first of our members to capture the comet in this image taken on the 18th of March from Birdlingbury near Rugby and you can clearly see the comet above the cloud layers in the evening twilight. He did well to capture this, I didn't even see it in these sort of lighting conditions. F 11 days later on the 29th of March, Sarah Meek caught the comet itself here. You can clearly see, although it's slightly out of focus, the tail of the comet and uh, the comparison to the background stars. 
1st of April, Easter Monday, I took this image of Panstars and the Andromeda Galaxy. And if you have a look at the relative positions of the Andromeda Galaxy and Panstars, you'll see that Panstars is almost due south of the Galaxy M31 itself. And if you look on the next few images, you'll see that the comet does clearly move against the background stars and M31. So on the 2nd of April it had already moved out from the almost due south position. On the 3rd it was at an angle of around about 30 to 35 degrees away from M31. Panstars is shown to the lower centre of the image near the roof of the house. M31 is shown slightly up and to the left of the centre of the image. And finally, on the 6th of April, three days after the last image, Panstars has clearly moved well above M31. That's actually the same house shown in this image. The comet itself looks like this. Um, it's taken on the same night as the last image on the 6th of April, so it was very low down towards some houses with a lot of reflected street lights. And the comet is actually 90 degrees clockwise rotated from where it appeared. The uh, tail was heading due north from the horizon. We'll now look at some of our members' images, starting with Sarah Meek. Going back to the plough, if you draw a line diagonally upwards through the upper one of the two pointer stars from the lower one in the uh, body of the plough itself, and go about the same distance again, you'll come to the pair of galaxies Messier 81 and 82. 81 is a face-on spiral galaxy, um, quite difficult to capture photographically and it, you do just tend to get a point of light with some uh, greyish areas around it in a DSLR. But Sarah Meek has taken this photo of M82, also known as the Cigar Galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy which is edged on to us. It's about 12 million light years away and this was taken with a 6 inch telescope. Move on to some of my images now. So some of the Red Ass members are taking their GCSE in astronomy this year, Dave Riley being one of them, and here he is on the 27th of January capturing the moon for his project on his laptop using his 6 inch Newtonian and a webcam. We'll move back to the plough again, and this time we'll work our way down from the back legs of Ursa Major to this backwards question mark sort of group of stars, which is known as the Sickle, and that's in the constellation of Leo, which is a crouching lion. This is an area very rich in galaxies. We have Leo to the right and Virgo to the left. And this is known as the Virgo cluster of galaxies. And you can see each one of these circles is actually a galaxy. We have the Sombrero galaxy at the bottom left. About a third of the way along at the top, there's a circle with a cross in it. That's actually a cluster of stars rather than a galaxy itself. It's the circles that are the galaxies. Looking at some of my images, here we have M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. The, it's actually a pair of interacting galaxies. It's also known as Object ARP 65. Holton ARP, in his Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, which was first published in 1966, listed 338 objects which didn't fit into any of the classical galaxy classifications. So he made his own catalogue up and these are interacting galaxies, galaxies with only one arm in the case of spiral galaxies or galaxies that emit strong radio waves. The second object we'll look at is ARP116. It's actually Messier object M60 which is interacting with the adjacent galaxy NGC4647 in this image and also at the top right hand side I've managed to capture MGC4638 in the same frame taken with a 9.25 inch Celestron telescope and a Canon EOS 500D DSLR camera on the 6th of April. On the 30th of March I got this one of M64, the Black Eye Galaxy, well named for the, it looks like it's been punched in the face and been given a large black eye under the nucleus. This is a large area of dust that, which obscures the background light. It's a bit of a strange galaxy actually, it's uh, two galaxies about a billion years ago collided and the central 
the stars of this galaxy rotate in one direction and the outer dust and gas rotates in the opposite direction which gives rise to a large amount of star formation on the interface between the two counter-rotating parts of the galaxy. M66 forms part of the Leo triplet of galaxies and you can see here is a moderately edge-on spiral galaxy. M87 is a strong radio source which is why it's also known as Virgo A and there is a 5000 light year long jet of gas coming out from the black hole at the nucleus of the galaxy which is a very strong emitter of radio sources. The jet itself is just about visible here in the main image and here in the enlargement in the corner. Here we have M101 at the pinwheel galaxy, a classic face-on spiral galaxy you can see the arms and the nucleus, although the nucleus is a fairly dim one compared to some of the other spiral galaxies. Uh, M101 lies about 20.9 million light years away. Moving on to M104, the Sombrero Galaxy, one of the classic images for astrophotography and astroimaging, taken on the 30th of March. You can clearly see the dust band running around the outside of the galaxy making it look like a Mexican sombrero and we'll be coming back to this one in a little bit. And here we have the Leo triplet of galaxies, M6566 at the top and bottom towards the right and NGC3628 on the left. This is also known as ARP317. A little bit closer to home we have the double cluster in Perseus. This is taken again with the Celestron C9.25 telescope and a 0.63 focal reducer. Without the focal reducer this would take about 6 frames to get uh, the same image but with the reducer it can all be captured in a single frame with the Canon digital camera. This is also known as Coldwell Object 14 and it lies about 7,500 light years away to the closest of the two clusters. It's actually moving towards us at 38 kilometers a second, so if you can hang around for 61,677,631 years, 6 months and 25 days, you'll actually have the pleasure of this object passing straight through the solar system. The next object and the final one in my collection is Coldwell 39 NGC 2392 the Eskimo Nebula. Even in a 9 quarter inch telescope you can clearly see the uh, reason why the nebula gets its name because it looks like a uh, person wearing a fur lined parka type hood. And what I'd like you to have a look at is the relationship between the lobe of the Eskimo Nebula towards the nearest star because we're going to be looking at this shortly with Chris Longthorne's images. Here is Chris Longthorne's image of the Eskimo ne Nebula, taken on the same night that I was taking mine, and he's using a CCD as opposed to a digital SLR camera. And you clearly see the difference in the quality of the images. The star, again, that the lobe is pointing towards is about 180 degrees out from where mine is, and uh, we'd like you to draw your attention to this part of the nebula, the lobe at the top and the fringing at the bottom. Because if we go on to the Hubble Space Telescope image, this is uh, 180 degrees out from Chris's image, and you can see the lobe towards the bottom and the fringing towards the top of the image. We'll compare the three images now. Uh, they have the DSLR image on the left, Chris Longthorne's CCD image in the middle, and the Hubble Space Telescope image on the right. The next image we'll compare with Chris's is my one of the Sombrero Galaxy and Chris took his, his image in New Mexico using a 14 inch SCT telescope and a full on CCD imaging system. It's, it's actually 10 5 minute exposures so it adds up to a total imaging time of around about 50 minutes which he did a little bit of processing on site and finished it all off in Photoshop and you can see not only the dust band surrounding the galaxy but also quite a lot of the structure within it and we'll leave you with this image which is a rather splendid one and we'll hope to see you next time that we do a broadcast <laughs>